Tim, take it away. It's all about digital experiences, how an uncommon microsite can multiply your customer engagement. Digital mic is yours. Awesome. Thank you, Kenny. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and start my presentation. All right. So today, yeah, like Kenny mentioned, we're going to be talking about uncommon microsites. Thanks so much to everyone who showed up to the webinar today. This is going to be sort of an interactive session. So be prepared to uh, throw answers in the chat. And then we'll also have sort of a Q&A at the end of this. So be thinking of questions along the way so we can have an open discussion at the end. Um, so let's get started. So maybe you showed up to this and you have no clue what a microsite is. If that's the case, it's basically just a small website focused on one goal. And there's millions of these things online. They're not really all that uncommon. But what makes a microsite uncommon is when it gives value to visitors and try, instead of trying to sell to them. Um, so we're going to look at some examples of that today. But here are some of the benefits we can have from an uncommon microsite. So first, people spend more time on the site. We started noticing when we were creating uncommon microsites at 368, our average session duration shot up to four times the industry average, just from creating something that gives value to people. And another benefit we'll see is these sites are shared and promoted organically. So you don't really have to spend a lot of money on advertisements. That organic promotion just happens. People just start posting it on social media, sharing it with friends, uh, which is a really cool part of an uncommon microsite. I remember seeing these squares pop up all over social media and asking my wife, hey, what is this? And she's like, you haven't heard of Wordle before? Um, and that's when I met Wordle. <laughs> but basically, Wordle got popular when it added the option to share your score on social media. And then that's when it really just blew up. And that just goes to show that word of mouth can't be underestimated. And the third benefit we'll receive from an uncommon microsite is it creates a favorable brand perception. So it's all about uh, influencing how visitors perceive your, your brand. And this can be the hardest to measure, but it's the most important because chances are you exist to do more than just sell a product or service. There's a reason why behind what you do. And really, these microsites just are an opportunity to create that first impression, someone who's never met your brand before, to really get a feel for what you stand for, and it starts to shape how they perceive you. So like I said, today, we're going to look at some great examples from companies all around the world, top companies who are creating these types of experiences, and we'll basically learn from them to see how you can apply these same concepts to your brand. Uh, but before we do that, we need to understand what the common experience looks like. What does a common microsite sort of entail? Um, so we're going to picture this through a real world scenario. Um, imagine yourself as the customer in this situation. <laughs> so as ridiculous as that seems, that's pretty much how 90%, 98% of all websites online interact with visitors. You, you enter through those doors, you land on the site, and there's all these messages saying, hey, buy this, buy that. Um, but notice how your perception changes when you walk into a place like this. The product's locked away. You have to ask someone in order to sample it. And that obstacle, that barrier sort of makes it feel more valuable to you. Um, and the same can be said with the way we interact with visitors online. So just to throw out like a rough example of what a common site looks like, it's all geared towards selling towards you, right? It's been highly optimized. Everything we've done, A-B testing, we know if we make the button 10% brighter or bigger, it'll lead to a 2% increase in sales. And it's like highly optimized to sell to you. And the truth about this sort of tactic is it works and there's a time and a place for it. If it didn't work, most sites wouldn't be doing this. But it may give you short-term gains. It does nothing for building a long-term relationship with an audience. So basically that's the common way basically that websites handle things. Most sites out there today are all geared towards trying to sell to you. Let's look at some, what is an uncommon example look like? So the uncommon example is all about trying to provide value to someone. And I remember when NFTs were first coming out, I sort of discovered this site and it was like this quiz. It showed up on these top websites of the day sort of list. And it was saying like quizzing you on what you think is more expensive, like really traditional, beautiful artwork or clip art. 
And so I went through this quiz and I was like surprised every time, most times I would guess like the traditional piece, it was actually wrong. Like I was surprised how expensive like the cheaper looking art was. And I was like, what is this? Why is it like more expensive? And I started to get curious, but there was no link back to the main website or to learn more. There was nothing. It was just play the quiz again or share it. That was the only options. And you may be thinking, why would a company invest all that time to make a quiz or a game like that and not give themselves a pat on the back for it? And this is where that, that concept comes back in of like, it creates this illusion of something you could be missing out on. I know for me personally, when I stopped asking people to subscribe to my YouTube channel, my subscribers started going way up because it was like, oh wait, now I got to take this upon myself. So that's what I did with this site too, is like, I saw there was a subdomain there and just deleted the subdomain, went back to the main website. I was like, I'm, I'm about to find out for myself who put this on. And it turned out to be like a bidding site for NFTs. And there was all this art and I was going through it and I was really curious, like, what is this all about? But if I would have landed on this sales site to begin with, I would have just bounced right off. And that's why we see bounce rates today on most sites so high is there's nothing there for people who aren't ready to buy yet. It's all geared towards selling to you. So all that to say, conversion happens as a byproduct of an uncommon experience. I went to Disney recently and noticed like, at the end of every ride or attraction, there's a gift shop and they put it at the end because after you have that great experience, now you're in a mindset where you're ready to make a commitment. But the way that we flip that around with most sites today is it's essentially our first date with a visitor. It's they're just getting to know us and we're asking them to make a commitment. We're proposing basically. And why would we expect to not get turned down if that's the way we're handling it? So all that to say, we lead with an uncommon experience, which creates buy-in, it fosters a relationship. How do we create that uncommon experience? Here's where we get to the good part. So let's actually look at the practical tools and tips of how to create an uncommon microsite. So there's three steps. The first one is make someone else the hero. So when we're making someone else the hero, it's all about putting the spotlight on them and not on ourselves. So the visitors in complete control, they're the hero of the story. We're just there basically as their sidekick. We're Yoda, they're Luke Skywalker. We're helping them along the way. And to give you an example of what that looks like, uh, when COVID was just first happening and we went remote as an agency, we decided to create an experience to sort of like do what we could to help the community. And it was this thing called viral positivity. And basically we created a message board, that's all it was to it, where visitors could come to the site and post encouraging notes for healthcare workers. So the visitors are the hero of the story to get a little bit more meta, the healthcare workers are the real hero of the whole story. And we're just there on the sidelines, not even mentioning ourselves. Um, and what happened as a result of this is over $100,000 was raised and direct donations to healthcare workers, people from around the world, thousands of visitors in other countries even, were posting encouraging messages to the site and visiting it. Um, and it was getting featured everywhere, but it was because we took the spotlight off ourselves and put it on someone else. And um, you may be thinking, well, that's easy to do with a topic like this, of course that's, that's gonna happen, right? But even in the most average marketing situations, this can still be done. So. To give you one more example, um, we had won Inc.'s Best Places to Work Award, and we were tasked with creating a lander to announce that we won this award. And when you think about that, it could become very self-focused, like just talking all about us and how great we are. But our strategists started deciding to flip the script, and we're like, all right, we're throwing a party here, and we're going to give you the main role of the DJ. You're in control of all the music. So when you land on the site, Project Turntable, really the award is just a small little piece in the middle of a record player. It's not even the whole goal of the site, but you land here and like you're in control of the whole experience. And it sort of changed things. The same things happened. Webflow shared it on their social media pages. It got featured on a bunch of like very famous Instagram accounts for web design. And it became sort of this recruitment tool where talent started following us. Whereas before we didn't really have so many designers on our socials. Uh, they were reaching out, they were like, our follower count just started skyrocketing uh, just from creating something like this where we put someone else 
in the spotlight of an experience. And it's a very simple thing. It's not like complex. I think instinctively, we all kind of know this. It's just like seeing real examples of it helps us uh, keep that forefront. So you ready for step two? Step two for creating an uncommon experience. Let's go. So second step, craft moments of delight. Um, all the little key milestones in a visitor's journey, whether they first sign up, whether they complete like a major milestone or do some sort of action, those are opportunities for us to inject delight. And we can't miss out on those opportunities. This is how it should look like when someone visits our site. Basically, they take a step, we feed them a little bit of delight, they take another step, and we repeat. So it's encouraging them to follow all the way through the whole process um, by just interjecting those moments throughout. And to give you an example of why this matters, so I have basically a smart TV, uh, but I went out of my way to buy an Apple TV, which has all the same apps, all the same features, and you may be thinking, well, that's just crazy. Um, but for me, it was like the moments of delight that really sold me over. So it's the way when you swipe past apps, the sound it makes. So you select a card and it expands to cover the whole screen. And it's like, it just doesn't feel the same when you use a regular TV. Um, so the functionality is the same. It's the moments of delight that make us choose one thing over another in those cases. Um, so what do we have? What can we use to basically create those moments? Well, here's our toolkit. We have gamification sound design, animations, micro interactions, and transitions. These are just like a couple of the tools we have at our disposal to basically create these moments where visitors want to continue throughout. And to show you a real example of this, this was created by American Society for Deaf Children. And it's basically an experience that teaches you sign language. So you land here and notice throughout the onboarding, the transitions, the animations, the thing they're doing to keep you engaged and what would be a boring experience otherwise, even setting up your webcam. And then once you have that, it's basically the points, the loading bar. It's the things they do to keep you engaged throughout the entire process to where you're ready to try this. I know after I finished the first level, I was like, wait, that wasn't enough. I want to, I want to go on and try the next level. And I didn't even realize I was learning from this. It was just happening throughout um, that's what happens when we create those moments of delight where it becomes an experience people want to use. And the last step for creating an uncommon experience is to personalize the experience. Personalization basically means everyone gets a unique experience. So um, you can make someone else the hero while still not making the experience unique to each person uh, just through the language you use on the site. But personalization is where you really just start to take it up a notch. Imagine landing on your favorite social platform or a movie streaming, music streaming, whatever it is, and getting the same feed that everyone else gets. You would spend a lot less time on that. So we don't have hours of data or months of data collected on our users to really be able to customize it that much for them. But here's what we do have at our disposal. Um, so geolocation, when someone lands on the site, we can know where they're coming from. We can know what time zone they're in. You may say that seems like something super simple, but with even just that little bit of data, microsites have been able to do crazy things like customizing uh, basically the time zone of the site to show if it's sunset where you are outside, the background of the site is sunsetting. Like it's, it, they go that detailed with it. Um, user granted info. We can ask them to give us access to some other platform that has more information on them. So I've seen sites that ask for sort of your Spotify playlist and they log in, they're able to get that. And then they customize it based on what they know about you from the music you like. So there's all kinds of different things you can do there. Um, device preferences. So this one's like if a user prefers light mode or dark mode, if they pre prefer reduced motion, there's all kinds of stuff there we can basically know about our user and adjust the site accordingly. Um, so that way when they land on it, they feel more at home instantly. And then the last one and the most important in my opinion is site cookies. So our sites can sort of adapt and evolve when the user's using it. Uh, we can gain information about the uh, user and use that to adjust our site as they move along. So a prime example of that is e-commerce. 
you're on a site and you look at five pairs of shirts and only one pair of shoes, well then in the recommended for you column, it's gonna show you mostly shirts because based on what it knows about you, that's what you're interested in at the moment. So that's not really hard to do. We basically just track decisions the users make and update the site. But here's something that takes it to a whole new level. So this was created by Adobe. Instead of trying to sell you Photoshop or Dreamweaver, what they're basically doing is creating a personality quiz here. And you go through, you answer some questions, it's learning about you, it's tracking what you've chose along the way. And it's using that to customize sort of the animations it shows and everything. And at the end, it says, uh, gives you your personality type with like a unique avatar for it and an option to share on social. And you may be thinking, why would anyone ever share this? But I was one of the ones who shared it when it first came out. We were all sharing it around the office it, because it was unique. It was interesting. Um, and it wasn't related to their product. They were just offering thought leadership in the industry they're in. So this is our first sort of reflection question. And feel free to think about this or put it in the chat if you'd like. But think through this. Why would someone be eager to share this experience? Think of some of the benefits it gives them. And um, yeah, just yeah. think let's through give, that. Let's give uh, folks like maybe 30, 45 seconds. This is where we're asking everyone, like you basically chat in the chat room. Why would someone be eager to share this experience? And I'm going to remind everyone to make sure you uh, send it to everyone versus just host and panelists. But I'll go ahead and read off stuff. That's cool, Tim. I don't think yeah, you can see you, the Tim. chat anyway. Uh, no, I can't. Sure yeah. <laughs> so let's see. We got Chloe here sends connection, makes you feel unique. Elizabeth Harris here says, redefining myself. Uh, Maria mm -hmm. says, people want to feel seen. Truth with that. Gaston, likability. Let's keep it coming, y'all. Renee to share something they learned about themselves and try to elicit responses from friends about the same. Some good ones here. It seems like people are yeah. like, you know, they see it. Yeah. Let's take maybe like two more. Okay. Comparing, contrasting personalities with their personalities with their friends so that people can mm -hmm. relate from Beverly, from Ben status, from Jenny. Uh, I think it helps people learn about each other. And from Jeremy, people like to talk about themselves. Smile emoji. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Uh, it helps you relate. I think Beverly said that to other people. Like when they're seeing their personality type, you know how to respond to them in situations. Um, yeah. yeah, so all of those are great values. Uh, I think they're, it's basically just teaching you and it's giving you a chance to be understood. Like there's so many different angles from it. Um, but it all comes down to just, it created some sort of value for you, something that you felt was worth sharing with someone else. And basically, if the, the main goal of any microsite should just be to create value. After we make someone else the hero, we personalize the experience and we craft those moments of delight. None of that matters unless there's some sort of value that you gain from it. And here's the four types of value we can create. So we can create value by encouraging people through educating them, equipping them, or entertaining them. And one site could even accomplish multiple of these goals. So through this last portion, uh, we're basically wrapping up here with a couple more examples. Um, I encourage you to think through with your brand, how would you create these different types of value for your audience? So that means you first have to know who your audience is and then what their obstacles are, what their goals are, and then think through this, how can you create these types of value for them? Maybe using a microsite. So looking at the first example, to encourage, this is all about being inspirational or motivating people to basically take a certain action. There's probably hesitations your audience has um, that's keeping them from accomplishing their goal. Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I can't do this because of this. And through encouraging them, we can basically motivate them to take a certain action. And this is usually done through storytelling. So we're gonna look at this example. It's by basically the um, US Air Force and they created this microsite. And if you think the US Air Force, a government agency, yes, they created a microsite that's around encouraging people. So check this out.
We initially got the call and zipped out there to see what the problem was. And unfortunately, the weather was too treacherous to land. So we ended up trying to drop supplies to the victims. And those were immediately swallowed up by the storm and they disappeared into the crevasses below. So we knew right then that we were going to have to go beneath the weather and make our way up to the survivors. temperature continued to drop. It drops about three degrees you know, per thousand feet. And the wind created a total whiteout. It was 60, 70 mile an hour winds. It was a wet snow and the visibility was just, was just heinous. Most of the time, we couldn't even see each other. It was times that I would maybe only see half the rope or it felt like that I could barely see beyond the tips of my skis. That evening, uh, the first of our Air Force rescue helicopters made its way to the crash site, and we were able to get the mother and two children off the glacier on that first trip, and the rest of us stayed the night until the rest of the Air Force helicopters were able to get up there and get the rest of us off of the glacier. So if you want to uh, see the full story, I definitely encourage you to visit the site. It's called Into the Storm. Um, but basically, think about what they did here. It's completely centered around their audience. Even the way it's kind of designed to feel like a video game is based on the type of people they would have applying here. Um, but it was all about making someone else the hero. In this case, the the hero of the story. But also, you could see yourself in that story if they if this worked out the way they wanted it to, where you could start to picture yourself as the hero in this story too. And that's really where the power comes in of making you want to apply here. So it's all about encouraging you to basically take a certain action. And I think this is just such a great example of that. Um, the next sort of value we can provide is to educate people. And think about it this way, what kind of obstacles does your audience face? And then what kind of information would help them get past those obstacles? So we had a client reach out to us once wanting us to create a PDF. And we were, of course, pitched an uncommon microsite. We're like, what if we just did this instead? And, and they went with it. But basically, it was about teaching child care center owners how to safely reopen after a natural disaster. And this was before Hurricane Ida or anything like that, before we really saw the use for this. But when we created this, it was through a direction of creating these sort of monsters, these disaster monsters. And we created all these videos and lessons that teach you the steps you need. There was an interactive checklist where you can check off the supplies you're going to need, and then it emails you a copy so you can go buy that. And then a quiz to sort of test your knowledge throughout on what you've learned. So all this is super bulleted points. There's not like tons of long copy you have to read through. And we try to make the information as easy to consume um, as possible for owners of child care centers. So when you can educate people in a way that sort of makes it fun to learn, they don't even realize they're learning. I think that's really the goal here with an uncommon microsite. We saw that with basically the Adobe example. We saw that with sort of the learning sign language. All these different examples are teaching you, but you don't even realize you're learning. It's really just fun. Um, so that's the goal here. And then the next example is to equip people with tools or resources. So what can you give them that will help them accomplish a task they need? And to give you an example of that, we created this school finder quiz for parents to find the school for their children. So they go through and answer a series of questions and it gives them the best schools in their area that match their results. And they can go and apply to those schools directly. Um, it also emails them a copy of sort of the schools that match uh, what they're looking for. So again, this isn't really trying to sell anyone, make them sign up for anything. It's really just trying to connect them with a school so they can go apply there. Um, and we saw like this was a hugely successful piece for us just because it was useful for people. It, it provides value. Um, so that provided them with the resources they need. Here's another example of a microsite that equips people and it actually was able to change laws. So check this out. Gerrymandering is a real problem. It's the practice of drawing voting districts 
in a way that creates unfair advantages for whoever happens to be drawing the line. Gerrymandering is the reason that some congressional districts look downright strange. We've got to end the practice of drawing our congressional districts so that politicians can pick their voters and not the other way around. Ugly Jerry. Ugly Jerry. It is a font created by your congressional district. Take a look, those are actually real congressional districts in the shape of letters. They are so magnificent together. Typeface is free on the microsite uglyjerry.com right now. Write a message and it'll use geolocation to tweet it at your Congress rep. It's so ugly. It's so incredibly, ugly. They're, they're, yeah. they're so ugly as to be beautiful. There you have it. My name has finally been gerrymandered. These have been mocked openly on social media. There's even a font now for gerrymandered districts. district is the C in a new font called Ugly Jerry, in which Jerry stands for this partisan process. Lindsay. What is gerrymandering? Correct. How cool is that, right? Zero dollars spent for millions and millions of impressions, hundreds of millions. And like, that's almost unheard of, but that's what a microsite can do when it just provides value to people. So this is our next discussion question is how did personalization help uh, this site visitors become the hero here? Yeah, let's see folks uh, come in on the chat room. What do y'all think? Besides it being awesome, Mike, I mean, we, we all agree. This is an amazing piece of work here with a great message. I think we give about 30, 45 seconds. Let's see. I see one here shows they're connected to the, their community. Thank you, Koi. I think there's a bunch of Koi wins in here. Uh, Elizabeth, we all want to do something. It gave us something we could do. From Travis, you can write directly to your Congress with the font, gives you control. That's a great one. See a couple. It's your more. message. Sorry, go ahead. Kim. Yeah, no. all you. Uh, yeah, I mean, like it's your message, right? And it's um your congressman that it's basically tweeting to, so or your representative. Um, yeah. So and you feel like you're taking part. What's that? We got a couple more here for you. Oh, uh, Renee, was... users got to spell out their messages and share them with their favorite quote unquote politicians using the font. <laughs> uh, let's see, Cody on our team, it empowers visitors to make a change. Uh, Gaston, mm -hmm. the font conveys how ugly this practice is. And Renee, they might even be able to use their own district in the process. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome, right? Yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah, I mean, so this is all about just giving people a resource or a tool to accomplish something and like there's so many ways a microsite can do that and it doesn't have to be complicated like if you look at this one essentially all it was was a text box with a font on on a website it wasn't anything super complex but they made it work um where people were able to get behind it and it became something pretty meaningful um so next up our value um that we can provide to people is to entertain them this is the last one and it's my favorite one. Um, it's all about understanding what your audience is interested in and then just turning that around and providing value to people. I was watching a webinar actually yesterday where, with a creator who created sort of this biking website and it had no purpose. It wasn't to sell bikes. It was just videos of all like his favorite trips uh, biking out in mountains and stuff. And he figured like this was getting submitted for web design awards. 
And he figured a lot of designers are probably also into this whole biking thing. And it just made a perfect fit. And like he won awards with it. He was featured on awards sort of showcase. Um, and then like he also got a sponsor from like a major bike biking company. Um, but all that to show that he just found something that his audience was interested in. And it doesn't have to be necessarily related to their occupation or what they do or the tool you're selling. It's just really connecting with them about something that they care about. And we, we like to do this all the time with our own passion projects. We did Santar, which was sort of this Christmas project. Um, we've done things for our own internal team. And this one's my personal favorite, uh, that we had just the goal of entertaining people was sort of this experience called Light the Fire Within. So we basically broke our team out into different groups on Zoom and they competed together to sort of answer these questions. We packed it with, you know, internal jokes and there, there was sort of this false countdown timer that popped up to scare everyone halfway through. Um, and at the end, they were able to find out where we're going to our team retreat. That was really the whole goal here, was just to announce it. Yeah, like the feedback we got from everyone here was they had a lot of fun. And that was just the only goal of this, just purely to entertain. And I think microsites can be great uses for that. So just to wrap up everything we talked about here, how do we create something that's uncommon? We make someone else the hero, we craft moments of delight, and we personalize the experience. So all those are sort of the tools we use, and then the site we create needs to provide value. And these are the four types of value we can provide, encourage people, educate them, equip, and entertain. Um, to really wrap this up, we created sort of this worksheet that walks you through like defining who your audience is, defining like the type of problems they face, and then sort of helping you ideate ideas of what kind of experience could I create for them that would really be something that provides value. I mean, thanks to no-code tools like Webflow, it's never been easier. It's never been more affordable to create something like this, and it's a great way to engage with people. So like Kenny mentioned, our 72-hour to-do is to email Kenny and kenny.in at 368.com and he'll send you a copy of this worksheet that you can complete to sort of come up with the idea for your next Uncommon microsite. Um, so with that, that wraps up everything today. We're going to go into some questions and answers. If you have any, feel free to share them in the chat. And at this point, we're just going to hang out and it's open discussion. So thanks so much. Tim, great work, man. I know you put a lot of time Thanks, into this. Um, I look forward for everyone here blowing up my email. Please do <laughs> that. I mean, I'm welcoming it. Whew, it's coming. But yeah, let's see some questions, y'all. Like, if you don't mind, uh, send it in the, the chat room, please. Oh, Chip, Tim, you already got some questions here. So Gaston asks, can you create a microsite with other no-code tools, such as like Airtable and uh, Zapier? Yeah, those play a huge part in it. When we were creating viral positivity, actually, we use Zapier. So there, it was just a Webflow form, but whenever someone submits, it sends their message and their email through Zapier and then post it as a, a item in the back end, unpublished. So each morning, our strategist would just go in, read through all the messages, make sure they were safe to approve, and then push them out to the live site. But if we didn't have that tool, the whole platform wouldn't have been possible. And um, Hopefully when Webflow comes out with sort of like their new logic feature that we, will, we won't even have to use Zapier. It'll just all be straight integrated in. So yeah, I so hope that helps. Tim, what do I have to do to sh ask you to show the I Killed a Cactus uh, website that you showed me? That was so uh, cool. Yeah, let me share that one. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can pull it up. This is a Basically, pretty website. Yeah. Yeah, it's like normally you would see content like this in a blog post that's just informing you how to keep your cactus alive, essentially. Um, but they created yeah. this whole microsite <laughs> for it. Let's see if I share my screen. So while we're waiting for Tim to do that, feel free to ask um, a couple questions. We got about 10 minutes left here, y'all. Let's make the most out of it. But yeah, Tim, feel free to talk through it. Man, this is so good. I thought it was pretty cool. It does take a little while to load. I think they could improve the performance a little bit. But basically, like, there, this is a plant, okay? Nice scroll interactions. It's really entertaining. And it's like location, okay? How do I want to keep this alive? 
and it tells you all about the temperature you're going to need. Walks you through every step. And I think at the bottom, there's like links out to related plants that you can purchase, but notice it didn't really lead with that. It's all leading with something entertaining, something educational, something that's going to provide value. And then here you can really go into to each one of those, but um, pretty short, pretty simple. I think the main theme with all these microsites is don't uncomplicate them uh, or don't complicate them. It's all about just finding a goal and solving that goal. And yeah, it's pretty straightforward, but it's really uncommon when you think about it. Yeah, especially about the subject. That shows you if you can make a, a site that's sexy about a cactus, I mean, that's not a lot of excuses then after that, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. If you can do that, you can make a site about anything. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're going to take about, um, let's see, two more questions here. Um, we got one from Gasson again. How does one drive traffic to these sites usually, especially if they're for a specific event and need to go semi-viral with a specific time frame? I can help weigh in on your answer too. Yeah. Um, I know for us personally, we like to share it on like Muesli. We like to share it on our socials. Um, there may be different award sites and it usually just starts getting picked up organically. Um, and that just happens, like like I said. But if you need a certain time frame, you may need to look into some promotion on it. And maybe Kenny, you could weigh in there. Yeah, a little bit of media. I mean, we, when it's yep. semi-viral, we always say, you know, I don't know if it's going to do that. But um, you know, like Jeremy just said here, getting a feature within a community where there's a watering hole of the talent that you're looking for or the eyes that you want to see, that's a great way to do it. Um, I mean, with Project Turntable, that was like a place for us to see talent like Inc. Best Places to Work, for example, we rode the wave on top of like a big media push. And so this was just something interesting that people not normally saw. So we wrote a, we wrote a hashtag on LinkedIn, like Best Places to Work. It was around that same conversation too. And we have a following for ourselves as well with Webflow. Um, as y'all know, you're probably here for Tim. So we just like struck lightning by knowing the right communities to go to. Yeah, like Jeremy said, um, yeah. a partner with a brand who can push the content on social. Yeah, partnerships as well. Um, really here is like, you know, it's not just to make the beautiful car, right? You have to put it in the places that the car is going to go. And that comes from partnerships. That comes from like award sites. That comes from like, you know, people sharing just through word of mouth. Um, that's like how things start building momentum. Maria has the last question here. Do you have any initial tips for leveling up a current common site without breaking the bank? I think find one piece of value you can provide. If you look at your site right now and there's nothing valuable for something before they fill out your form, like to, to make a purchase or contact you, then that's a problem. And what you can do is start thinking through this worksheet, this worksheet is gonna be your tips basically where you'll go through it and it'll say, all right, what's gonna be the most valuable for my audience? And then once you have that, there's different levels of how extreme you can go with it from things that require custom development and it's crazy or something that you can build on your own. Maybe it's a, a PDF giveaway like we're doing with this worksheet, or maybe it's something in the mid level where you can build with Webflow without needing a, a developer or someone else to help. So there's all kinds of ranges of how, um, uh, I guess, uh, how much fluff you can throw into it, but just find the piece of value that's going to matter and then just find some way to add that to, to your site. Thanks for answering that. I think we have one more. Thank you. That's super helpful. Oh yeah. Can we take one more question, Tim? Yeah. Yeah. So let's see one more question in the chat here. I mean, Tim's heart, like, you know, this is where you definitely want to learn from the master here. Um, Tim, I'll ask you one question while we wait. Uh, what are, what's like the, where in the process when creating an uncommon microsite that gets super complicated, most people give up. Like, how do you go past what, what's that part of the process? And like, how do you go past that? The idea phase, I think, like so many microsites get shot down in the idea phase. I know Santar almost got shot down. The designer who came up with it pitched it to us all and we thought it was a terrible idea. We're like, yeah, we're not going to do that. And he was like, wait, but let me just show you. And he started sketching and then, then we start to understand, oh, this is what you meant by this. And like it came to life. But like just coming up with that idea and workshopping it together is the hardest part. After that, the execution can, can fall into place. To describe Santar's, do you mind pulling it up? 
to actually yeah, describe yeah. it was is pretty difficult. You have to know what Zoltar is, for example, uh, to even relate to it. Yeah, I think y'all will enjoy this. So we can end with this one. Um, this this was a really fun project here, but yeah, like Tim said, like the ideation phase is so important, and it's important for us to not let good ideas die. Um, so yeah, Tim, you can walk through like this this experience. Basically, you come to this site and you get a unique fortune from Santar. So there's this whole backstory, which is hilarious. If you want to read through that after, definitely do. Our own very own uh, designer, Corey Schneider, voiced over Santar here. But ho, ho, ho. Greetings. I am Santar, great wizard of the North Pole. Let us see what your future holds. I can't believe this is Corey. Right. <laughs> and then you basically drag in the token, which is the cookie, into the milk. Let go. Mm. Have you been naughty or have you been nice? Oh, interesting. Enlighten yourself with the words of the great centaur. And then you get to take your fortune. And it's just a randomized each time you'll get something different. <laughs> and then you get a chance to retry it. Uh, I think we had a giveaway with this too. Um, yeah, we did. Where you shared your, your fortune on social for a chance to win a prize. Yeah. Yeah, that's how we bring it to life. Just beyond just the digital experience. Here's a connection experience with us as well. Um, yeah, just imagine the designer trying to explain this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a very uh, interesting concept. So y'all, if you wouldn't mind, please give it for Tim in the chat room here. Like he spent a bunch of time putting this together and sharing the knowledge. Um, Tim, thank you so much for doing this. We're going to, we're going to go ahead and close because, you know, we're going to give people 10 minutes back. That's the best, you know, that's, that's a great gift, right? But you can probably see from here in the chat room right now, you know, you can see a lot of love here. Jay says, thanks, Tim. Great presentation, Travis. Thanks, Tim. This was great. You know, you can already see people pouring in. But with that being Thanks said, so uh, we're going to ask everyone to make sure you do the to-dos because we do have that worksheet as well. We want you to keep the momentum going. So we hope to see you in my inbox. And on top of that, we hope to see you for the next TSC webinar, which uh, actually yours truly, myself, will be hosting, I believe, on May 20th on how to build an uncommon brand. So hopefully we'll see you then. And thank you so much for uh, staying with 368. We'll see you all soon. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone. Take care.